Well, hello and welcome to the 2021 Immunisation Coalition Influenza Webinar. My name's Susie Blackburn and I'm representing the Immunisation Coalition hosting tonight's presentation. At the Immunisation Coalition, we're looking to educate and promote vaccination. And it's an interesting time for influenza because although there's not much in the community, um, we do need to have a look at the issues around vaccinating during the COVID vaccination period and during the new world that we have at the moment. Welcome to the many of you, the hundreds of you that are viewing it from all over Australia. And for those that are new to the event, I'll get you to just remind you that if you have any questions throughout the session tonight, please use the Q&A box throughout the meeting. We'll uh, ask our presenter some questions throughout the session, as well as have a little discussion period at the end. If you're here for 50 minutes plus, you will automatically get sent a certificate of attendance, which many of you may be able to use for your PD. Also, just so you know, a recording of this event is available in the coming weeks on our website. And if you do, if you do fill out the survey or questionnaire at the end of the presentation, you can also be sent a certificate of attendance. So let's get straight into it. We're going to get you to complete a poll if that's okay. So I'll just launch a poll about where you're coming from. So up on your screen, you'll see that you have several options. Please indicate the expertise area that you're coming from so that we can get a good idea. Fantastic. Just a few more seconds and we'll reveal the results. Looks like we've got all oh, 95, 94% nurse practitioners and midwives in the in the uh, audience tonight. Welcome. All right. Now, without no, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our presenter for tonight's presentation, Angela Newbound. Angela is an immunisation education consultant based in South Australia and a member of the Immunisation Coalition. She's been involved in immunisation program delivery in South Australia for 20 years, originally as a provider and program coordinator, and has had roles within the Division of General Practice, SA Health, Immunisation Section and Medical local networks, such as the Primary Health Network. She provides clinical advice, support and education to a range of immunisation providers across South Australia and contributes to the development. Angela has been running these webinars for some time and uh, we really appreciate your involvement. Thanks so much, Angela, and you can take it away when you're ready. Thank you very much. And thank you um, to the Immunisation Coalition for inviting me to present this webinar tonight. And certainly thank you all for joining because it's just such a hugely busy time of year for you at the moment. Um, I'm going to turn my video off um, just to assist with issues with Wi-Fi. So um, you won't see me presenting, which is fine, but you will certainly hear me. So I shall just click off. And we can then get started on our presentation. So I think uh, everybody that is on this webinar is well versed with what influenza is. Um, we probably get a little bit caught up with, oh, you know, you haven't had the flu unless you've been really, really sick. Uh, you, you would have been in bed for two weeks. It would have knocked you out like a, you've been hit by a truck, all of those sorts of things. But I think it's really important that we also understand that 50% of infections with normal seasonal influenza um, actually may be asymptomatic. Um, and this might be due to some partial immunity that they have from, from that particular circulating strain. Um, the problem is that these asymptomatic patients can actually still shed virus and can transmit disease. Um, probably, possibly not at the same rate um, as the symptomatic individuals. But this is a really important bit of information because we have so many people that tell us, you know, oh no, I, have, I don't get a flu vaccine because I've actually never had the flu. Um, well, to be really quite honest, unless they've actually been having PCR swabs, you know, every week, they actually don't know whether they have had influenza or not. So 
vaccination is super important because we can't afford for people to contract this disease, whether they are asymptomatic or whether they are symptomatic. Obviously, uh, the flu virus needs to attach to our cells, it needs to break into our cells. Um, and certainly the viral protein spikes that are on the surface of the virus, which are hemagglutinin um, and neuraminidase. And this is where, when we talk about flu viruses, we're always talking about a H1N1 or a H3N2. And there's quite a range of different H and N influenza viruses that do infect um, humans. We know that hemagglutinin plays an exceptionally big role. Um, it has an antigenic glycoprotein, which um, it, it, it acts on the, the surface of the influenza virus. It binds onto that um, monosaccharide um, sialic acid, uh, which is present on the surface of the target host cells. And throughout this endocytosis process, the viral RNA genome enters into the cell's cytoplasm, and then we've become infected with influenza. So neuraminidase also plays a really important part. Um, they seem to think that it is there to remove the receptors for influenza virus. Um, from newly formed virus particles so that and it allows for them to be released. So hemagglutinin helps the flu virus invade our cells and neuraminidase helps that cell wall to break open and new um, viruses uh, to be released so they can infect all of our other cells. Once the, the virus breaks open our cell wall, that particular cell dies. So it's not a good virus to have. We're actually going to have uh, three polls um, in our presentation tonight, and this is the first one. So what best describes antigenic shift? A, is it a random genetic mutation of an infectious agent resulting in minor changes in proteins called antigens? B, is it the accumulation of a series of minor genetic mutations? Is C, viruses that are really closely related to one another, and this can be illustrated by their location close together on a um, phylogenetic and genetic tree? Or is it D, an abrupt major change in an influenza A virus resulting in new hemagglutinin and or hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins in influenza viruses that affect humans. I'll just give you a few seconds to answer that one. We've got about 40% who have currently voted, Angela. So okay. I'll keep it on screen for a little bit longer. Sure. Let people have a think. It's a good question. Lots of good choices. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll give it five more seconds. Durant's is in. And let's have a look at the answers. Wow. No. So, yeah, quite spread across all of them, isn't it? Okay. That's right. So the actual answer is uh, D. It's the fourth one down. So 48% of you got that right. It's really an abrupt um, major change in an influenza A virus. So we know that influenza viruses are class, classified antigenically as either uh, types A, B or C. Influenza A and B viruses are really clinically important in causing human disease. We don't get um, any notifications of influenza C. It is a really mild illness um, and often presents like a common cold anyway. So it's not a notifiable disease such as influenza A and B. So 
antibody against the surface antigens, particularly against um, hemagglutinin, reduces infection or severe illness in, uh, due to influenza. So we definitely need antibody against um, these particular viruses. We also know that influenza A undergo frequent changes in their surface antigens, so those surface proteins. And that causes a sidewise mutation, if you like, um, of the genes coding for the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. So this results in changes um, and they can be just cumulative changes. And so we see this each year and that's known as antigenic drifting. And that's sort of just the outbreaks that we see each year. However, when there's been quite a significant change in our hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins, then we can see a complete shift away from anything that we've really encountered before. And we've, we've seen this over the years when we have had um, influenza pandemics. So if we look at the spread of influenza, we know coughing, sneezing, all of those sorts of things certainly spread it, certainly touching contaminated um, surfaces. So if there's any respiratory secretions on those surfaces. I did say before that some people are completely asymptomatic, but those who do become symptomatic usually we'll start complaining of things like a bit of a cough or a sore throat, feeling a little bit tired, run down, unwell. They may have some chills, some um, headaches, et cetera. Doesn't, um, you know, particularly lay them too low for, for too long if they are robust and healthy people. However, um, we can't predict that. And some young, healthy people, even young children, can become seriously ill and die from influenza disease. So some of the complications that uh, influenza can cause, um, you can see here on this particular the list. We'll talk about some of these and particularly around um, you know, cardiovascular complications and complications with um, the respiratory tract. But if you are needing a little bit more information in regards to Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, the NCIRS, so the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance, has a fantastic fact sheet on their website in regards to influenza vaccination and Guillain-Barre syndrome. What we do know is that Guillain-Barre syndrome may um, certainly come about post viral illness, influenza being one of those. Um, certainly the most common precursor to Guillain-Barre syndrome is Campylobacter infection. So, and there was some reports around in the mid 1970s in the United States around um, a, a, an army camp that were all immunized against a particular influenza that season. Um, and there were what they believed to be more than the usual cases of Guillain-Barre post-vaccination. So there's always been this little association with possible Guillain-Barre following flu vaccination. But what we do know is that that would be very rare uh, GBS probably will occur more so, like I said, from a Campylobacter infection. Um, but once someone has had GBS in their lifetime, they are at higher risk of a recurrence of GBS. We cannot guarantee them that a flu vaccine may not precipitate that recurrence. So it's about having a conversation with your patients, but GBS generally is not a contraindication to flu vaccination. But certainly have a look on the NCIRS website and download that fact sheet if you're needing to have some more information on hand. So we know each year we have a, a, a reasonable number of our community come down with influenza. We don't really know the numbers because, like I said, if you're asymptomatic, you're certainly not going to be reported as having flu. 
So in most years, um, the providers out there are very busy. You're looking at over 300,000 GP visits, 18,000 hospitalizations. Um, we, we know that the death rate attributed to influenza is greatly underreported because it just depends on how the death has been coded um, by the hospital system. So if somebody uh, presents with a, a stroke or a myocardial infarct and they die, then usually that's what's written as the cause of death. But in a number of cases that may well have been um, actually precipitated by a case of influenza. So last year, of course, was very different. I don't think anybody was this busy last year with the flu cases that we had. Um, so it's going to be a real watch, wait and see to what we see this year in 2021. This just confirms really the difference in the years. So 2019, we had a horrific influenza season. More than 300,000 cases, we had um, higher rates of hospitalization as well, but look what happened last year. So 2020 down to 2,000, uh, you know, 21,000 notifications, um, 15 admissions to Sentinel sites. So that doesn't cover every hospital site, of course, only the Sentinel sites and only one into ICU in one of those Sentinel sites. So we certainly did not have a significant flu season in 2020. And we will talk about that. So let's have another little poll just to keep you on your toes. So international studies reveal that healthcare settings have some of the highest rates of sickness presenteeism. So that's people going to work sick. What percentage of healthcare workers in Australia admit to going to work with an influenza-like illness? Is it 40% of us or 25% of us, 60% of us or 74% of us? There's a little bit of a spread on the results of this one as well. Right. People are a bit quicker off the mark though. We've got about 80% voted. A few more seconds to go. Interesting. Let's have a look. Okay, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, so for those of you that got 60%, which was answer C, and 42% of you um, managed to get that one right, that is the official figure. Um, Isn't that huge, Angela? That is huge. <laughs> But unfortunately, that number actually jumps to 99.2% for healthcare workers when experiencing minor flu symptoms, including a cold, sore throat, fatigue, sneezing, runny nose, mild cough and reduced appetite. Interesting. I wonder if that'll change. I'll let you continue, but, uh, you know. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So... It's really very interesting that healthcare workers just keep on soldiering on and it is not the best thing to do because we know that if a healthcare worker goes to work unwell, the, the risk of transmitting whatever the virus is that you have to co-workers or to patients that you are looking after um, is exceptionally increased. And patients that you are looking after are there for you to um, make better, not make worse. So hopefully the mentality around, oh, I've just got to go to work because otherwise we're short staffed and all of those sorts of things. Now with COVID and the education that people have had around do not come to the office, do not come to work if you have any symptoms at all. Um, hopefully they will be adhered to and um, workplaces will now be a lot more tolerant 
for staff calling in sick. Because that has been a problem in the past is people don't want to call in sick because their workplace doesn't like it. So who's at risk of complications from death? Well, we certainly know that um, people do die from, from this particular disease. And in 2019, there were around about 812 influenza associated deaths that were reported to the National no Notifiable Disease Surveillance um, System. Median age was 86 years of, old, of age. So we're looking at babies less than one right up to a very elderly at 106. So the range of people that die from influenza can be the very young all the way through to the very old. So um, it's, it's not just a death, um, you know, really for older people. It can be younger people, but it's mostly older people. So if we look at the 2020 deaths that were reported, um, 37 deaths basically equated out to being one death per 575 notifications. And this is the, actually the lowest rate of influenza related deaths recorded in the last five years. So last year, significant season in the fact that there wasn't a season. Deaths occurred largely in older adults with 77% were in people over 65 years of age. The median age was 78 years, um, and that ranged from a four-year-old through to 97-year-old. 27 um, of those were unsubtyped influenza A. Seven of those deaths were with H1N1, one of them with H3N2, and two from influenza B. Um, but definitely always remember that the, the number of reports for influenza associated deaths that are reported to the NNDSS really do not represent the true mortality associated with this particular disease. So we definitely know that uh, we have individuals in our communities that are at increased risk. So definitely all um, individuals at 65 or greater and certainly all older Australians and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Definitely any individual um, with any chronic conditions or any other factors predisposing to severe outcomes from influenza really should be getting a vaccine if they are over six months of age. And this certainly includes pregnant women, um, people with cardiac disease, chronic respiratory disease, all of those other illnesses that require frequent um, medical follow-ups or certainly in hospitalizations in the preceding year. Once again, the list continues. Um, just obesity on its own can contribute to higher complication rates of influenza. Just note that not all individuals can receive funded influenza vaccine. Um, so it's really important that we have a copy of our funded influenza program for our state or territory that we live in right next to us when we're making um, the decision of which vaccine we should be offering our patients. So who else? Really, we know that uh, children aged between six months and five years are, are, have significant disease burden. They have high rates of disease, high rates of hospitalisation. And we know on the funded NIP, the National Immunisation Programme, that all children that are six months of age or up to less than five, up until their fifth birthday, are funded under the NIP. But that doesn't stop us asking every person about flu vaccine. So anybody that is not in the funded groups, so those children that are over five years of age, we still should be asking and encouraging influenza vaccine. We know that there are some people 
um, that are, you know, in long-term care facilities and aged care facilities that we certainly need to be um, paying particular attention to. Um, and certainly if they are less than 65 years of age as well, if they are in an RACF or a long-term care facility, then we should be really um, covering them with influenza. We have learnt definitely with COVID infection how quickly um, these viral illnesses do overtake an aged care facility. So in South Australia, we actually fund a state program for people experiencing homelessness, but in other states and territories, it's really a group of people that need to have some attention paid to them because they are living in um, certainly adverse living conditions. So let's take a closer look then at some of these um, medical conditions that do increase risk of complications to, inf uh, to influenza. We know that influenza affects the vascular system in multiple ways. Um, we know influenza is associated with, you know, greatly increased number of pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic um, cytokines. Uh, we know that it causes endothelial dysfunction, um, increased plasma viscosity and tachycardia. There's really mounting evidence in support of a significant role for influenza infection in the development of atherosclerosis um, and the triggering of its complications. And there've been major studies that have been done to really explain the factors that convert established and stable atherosclerotic plaques into unstable and life-threatening plaques and acute coronary syndromes that involve the rupture of these vulnerable plaques, um, which are usually um, non-obstructive. But we do know that when these plaques then rupture, um, a thrombotic effect will occur. So this is where we see um, an increased presentation of myocardial infarcts um, in the flu season. So our patients with um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are certainly also in that risk factor. And we know that, um, you know, most of the studies around this have been done certainly in um, the elderly who usually have coexisting disease um, along with their COPD. Um, but certainly much of the morbidity and the mortality associated with COPD um, and influenza is really just the fact that the influenza virus really exacerbates, um, you know, these uh, acute episodes. These exacerbations really are caused by a number of things. And, but the commonest cause, of course, is infection of the tracheobronchial tree. Um, and certainly viruses such as influenza virus have a real big role to play there. Um, there's certainly epidemiological and experimental evidence that respiratory um, infections or viral respiratory infections, particularly those caused by flu, um, increase that incidence of the secondary bacterial infection such as pneumonia. And therefore there is real potential for significant virus bacteria interaction in um, COPD um, patients. So we need to watch them really closely. Closely. So you would be seeing probably quite a lot of asthmatics that come into your clinics. And we know that flu is among the several potential triggers um, for an exacerbation of asthma. Infection with a flu virus can really exacerbate that inflammation of the airways and the lungs and, and triggering them to make their asthma um, symptoms worse. Um, you probably realistically not more prone to getting flu if you have asthma, but you are more likely to experience related complications such as bronchitis or pneumonia and probably uh, require hospitalisation as a result of your flu infection. We know that people even with mild or well controlled asthma are at high risk of serious health outcomes from flu. 
However, the vaccine is only funded for patients with severe asthma. And that means that they require frequent medical consultations or the use of multiple medications. So we know that conditions such as bronchiectasis um, usually produce more mucus than unaffected areas of the lung. Um, and this excessive production of mucus is um, really increased by lots of different factors, including cigarette smoke, but certainly infection as well. And so pneumonia is a really big risk for these individuals. You would also be seeing a lot of diabetics in your clinic, no doubt. Uh, diabetes is really um, very uh, epidemic. We know that somebody with diabetes has a greater risk of any infection, whether it's viral or bacterial. Whether it's type one, type two, or even gestational diabetes, even if it's well managed, they have an increased risk of serious complications to flu, usually often end up in hospital and sometimes can die. We know that flu makes chronic health condition problems like diabetes worse. And this is because diabetes can make the immune system less able to fight infection. Acute illnesses can make it harder to control blood sugar levels. And we know that glucose levels can impact the severity of influenza infection. And hyperglycemia is related to the worst outcome in both bacterial and viral infections. So diabetics can access funded influenza vaccine. So even if you have a patient who thinks that they are a healthy diabetic, well, we know that there's no such thing as a healthy diabetic. Um, they, are, they may be a stable or well-controlled diabetic, but they're certainly not a healthy diabetic. Um, they may refuse flu vaccine because they think that they are healthy, but um, this, this can be a really significant um, infection for them. And there are a sizable number of deaths that are associated with um, influenza and pneumonia. So people with diabetes four times more likely to die with pneumonia and influenza than people without diabetes. So maybe that's a, a really good statement to give to those people who do not believe that they are at risk um, of severe influenza. We know that pregnant women um, certainly have shown to have an increased risk for morbidity um, with influenza illnesses. And that's both through seasonal epidemics as well as pandemics. We know that in um, pandemics gone by, pregnant women were overrepresented in the death rate and in ICU admissions. We know that newborn infants that are born to, to mothers with influenza during pregnancy, um, and especially if they have severe influenza disease, they have um, increased risk of adverse outcomes such as preterm birth and uh, low birth weight. We know that infants less than six months of age who experience influenza infection have the highest rates of hospitalization and death of all children. So vaccination with influenza vaccine in pregnancy, not only protects the woman, but also the baby. We know that um, we need to vaccinate them in pregnancy though, to get those maternal antibodies to cross the placenta, to afford that little baby some protection against flu in the first six months of its life, because we cannot vaccinate babies under six months of age with influenza vaccine. This is an important vaccine for travellers. Now, <laughs> we're all having a little bit of a giggle because uh, you know we've certainly seen the numbers of international travel uh, rising over the years, um, but of course, something kind of came to a halt in 2020, uh, around about March, in fact. But we do know that if we get on top of this COVID, vaccine, uh, this, this, this COVID infection, 
this pandemic, which we will, we will get over it. It, it will, we will get past it. And we know that we'll be back traveling again. So closing borders has not only controlled COVID-19 here in Australia, but it's also controlled flu. Um, so it's really been a very big double benefit and maybe airlines should be mandating flu vaccination if you're boarding a flight as well as a COVID vaccination because it certainly makes an exceptionally big difference to our numbers. So certainly NH and MRC, which is the National Health and Medical Research Council recommends um, that annual influenza vaccination is for any person aged over six months of age. So we are the promoters, we are the seed sowers, we are the ones that need to raise this conversation with every patient that we see every year, every time we see them, because this is an important vaccine to have. We know that there is um, certainly free vaccine and highly recommended in that group with severe um, medical conditions that put them at risk of severe disease and complications. So just to wake you up once again, we've got another poll. So who is recommended to receive two doses of an influenza vaccine four weeks apart in the same year? Is it children less than nine years of age receiving flu vaccine for the first time? Is it individuals having flu vaccine for the first time post solid organ transplant or hemopoietic stem cell transplant? Is it women who have already received a dose of flu vaccine and then become pregnant in the same year? Is it A, B and C, all of the above? Or is it actually none of the above? Looks like it's between two for many of them, Angela. Okay. Yeah. I'll give them a few minutes. We've got about 70% voted. Right. A couple of seconds. And I will share those results. Okay. Wow. Really good. Really good. Okay. So you're all thinking about it, that's for sure. But certainly those of you, the 51% of you that said all of the above, are correct. So these really are the only individuals that two doses of flu vaccine would be recommended in the same flu year. So for children under the age of nine, if they are flu vaccine naive, in other words, they've never had a flu vaccine before, and they're receiving it for the very first time, then we would be giving them two doses four weeks apart. We need to give them that second dose because the first dose is going to produce some level of protection, but we certainly need to boost it in their um, flu vaccine naive immune system. With your hemopoietic stem cell transplant and solid organ transplant patients, um, influenza infection um, may present with severe disease in these particular individuals. The main risk factors for severe in influenza infection um, following a solid organ transplant um, really is the shorter time from transplant and the presence of, um, of pneumonia, that developing of pneumonia. There is lower respiratory tract infections are associated with significant morbidity in solid organ transplant recipients. So we don't know that the vaccine, well, we, we kind of know that the vaccine is not probably going to be as effective in these individuals either. Um, but certainly it is still, still worthwhile giving it to them. And we would definitely be giving them two doses four weeks apart um, in their first year post transplant. Obviously that related mortality for both the solid organ as well as the hemopoietic stem cell um, realistically is the development of pneumonia. And that's with or without the presence of frequently 
um, isolated co-pathogens. So protecting these people from developing a pneumonia um, is absolutely paramount. So we need to protect them from influenza to uh, reduce the likelihood that they will develop um, a pneumonia following that influenza um, infection. And we've talked about pregnant women. It's about vaccinating them um, in pregnancy. So if you have seen a woman come into your practice and perhaps she's a, she came in last week and she's wanted her flu vaccine because she's in a high risk occupation or she just wants one. And she comes back and sees you in June or July this year and says, yay, I'm pregnant. Then we would definitely be recommending that you give her another flu vaccine in pregnancy. And it can be at any stage of pregnancy, okay? Because we want those maternal antibodies built in order for them to transfer across the placenta to that little bub. So we've talked a little bit about these at-risk groups. There is quite the list for those who can get government funded influenza. And this list is available, of course, on your state um, influenza program charts that you should be able to download and have by your side. So this is the big $64 million question. When do we administer influenza vaccine? Um, if I had a bag of chocolate frogs, um, you would win them if you could give us the correct answer. The problem is that we don't know what the correct answer is. What we do know is that when we vaccinate somebody against influenza and with like other most vaccines, we do need to allow that 10 to 14 days for those protective antibodies to be built. We know that we've got to perhaps vaccinate just before the influenza season arrives. But when is that? Generally, on a good year, we could predict that possibly around June, July and August, maybe into September, we have our highest notification rates. But if we wanted to look at what happened in 2019, then we had significant um, influenza activity throughout the year. So we had pre-season flu or interseasonal flu notifications coming through at a much higher rate in early 2019. We went on to have an early start to the season. So in that case, we were caught short. We had lots of cases, people were dying and we had no vaccine um, in the market. Interestingly enough, and we'll show a graph a little bit later that 2020, actually started out the same with high interseasonal flu activity. So duration of protection, that's always the big thing. Generally, it is best three to four months post vaccination. And depending on which strain of influenza, uh, there is that um, dropping off of antibody protection, particularly if it's a H3. So elderly people, of course, don't respond as well to flu vaccines because of immunosenescence, but it's still worthwhile giving them flu vaccine because even small amount of antibodies built, we know does stop them from having to be transferred to hospital or dying if they contract influenza. So it is a little bit of a tricky situation of when should we be administering influenza vaccine? Um, certainly vaccinations have already started. Providers are getting funded flu vaccine into their fridges as we speak. The pharmacists have had private stock now for about three weeks or so. So as flu vaccine comes into your fridge, although we're not seeing a lot of cases, you can still um, go ahead and start vaccinating. If someone's had flu vaccine last year, we definitely need them to have it again this year. Even if they had it very late in the year last year, they need to have a 2021 formulation 
because the viruses are always changing and therefore the, the vaccine composition is also changing and it certainly has this year. So definitely um, we need to have annual vaccines. Remember the tr only two true contraindications to influenza vaccine um, is anaphylaxis following a previous dose of influenza vaccines or anaphylaxis following um, a vaccine component. Remember your people with egg allergy, including anaphylaxis, can safely be vaccinated with influenza vaccines in any setting. It can be a community setting. Um, they can go ahead and have the full dose. Uh, we do not need to be splitting doses into and having smaller doses or anything like that. We just give them the full dose. In Australia, routine 15 minute waiting period is all that is required. However, if there's significant parental anxiety or, or health professional anxiety, um, it's not unreasonable to ask them to wait around for 30 minutes. But otherwise, adverse events are relatively common, um, short lived, last probably one to two, maybe to three days. But these rare adverse events um, are really quite rare. So we have different vaccine composition this year. Um, we have egg-based flu vaccines. So Victoria, which is a H1N1, um, an A strain, Hong Kong, which is the H3N2-like virus. We have got both of the B strains. Now they decided, remember a few years ago, we only had three strains to our flu vaccines um, and I, because there were two A's and one B. Um, it seemed to make sense to put the other B strain in. We've only got two lineages of B, Victoria and Yamagata. Those um, B strains don't really um, have those frequent mutations quite like what, the influenza A viruses do. So it's kind of a 50-50 guess of whether we put in the Victoria or the Yamagata. So um, quite safe to put um, both of the B lineages into the vaccines. So you can see what was in last year's vaccine um, and there's three change outs for this, this year. So what do we have this year? We've complicated the, the you know, what's available to us now. We've got a choice. We can have an egg-based flu vaccine or we can now have a cell-based flu vaccine. So for the first time in Australia, we have a cell-based vaccine and you will notice that there is a different A strain here. So Wisconsin A strain instead of Victoria, um, but it has the other um, strains the same. So this particular vaccine is called Flucelvax Quad. It's the first cell-based influenza vaccine that's been offered in Australia. This is something for you to have a conversation with your patients about. It will be more expensive to buy on the private market. It will not be on the NIP this year at all. So it will only be on private prescription or if someone goes to the pharmacy immunization service in, um, they could ask for it. Probably around about $40 a dose versus an egg-based vaccine that's probably around $20 a dose. Um, but this vaccine has been widely used overseas. So it's not a new vaccine, it's just new to Australia. So it's really important that we use the word new very, very carefully, because if we say this is a new vaccine, people get very nervous about new. They think it's hot off the press, it's straight off the production line, it hasn't been tested or trialled enough. So we just need to make sure that people understand this is widely used overseas, but it's the first time that we've had it here in Australia. Angela, I might take this moment just to pop a couple of questions in, if that's okay. Sure. 
So Anne has asked, in the event that someone has received a vaccine at the chemist yes. and they're over 65 years of age, yes. do you have four weeks before immunising with the appropriate dose? Okay. If somebody over the age of 65 has already received a 2021 vaccine at the chemist or at the pharmacy, they do not need any further doses. So there is absolutely no recommendation at all to call them back for a fluad quad, none whatsoever. Right. So um, all of the quadrivalent influenza vaccines are registered for use in people over 65. It's just that fluad quad is the preferred vaccine for the over 65s. Great. Thank you. Okay. And it looks like you're very clever, Angela, because you've actually answered two questions in one. Um, so thank you. No worries. And just a little bit more about that cell-based vaccine, just so you, you've got a little bit more information to um, talk to your um, patients about, is flu vaccine effectiveness is really impacted by a few different factors. And one is the declining immune function of the elderly people. And the other is viruses that are naturally mutating. Now, us as humans can't really do much about that. But the other influencing factor is the vaccine itself, because when um, flu viruses are grown in embryonic chicken eggs, so in an avian environment, then those flu viruses have um, the potential to change. So the, the avian proteins or the egg proteins can often um, change what the flu virus looks like that has been put into the egg. So when they then harvest the flu virus out of the egg, it actually isn't really the same match as what went into the egg. And so this is called egg adaptation. And this is particularly important around the H3 viruses. H3 virus does not do well in egg culture. So if they change the way that flu, virus, uh, flu vaccines are manufactured and they look at using cells, and in this particular instance, they have used mammalian cell culture. So the cell line that has been used for the manufacture of this particular vaccine, uh, flu cell vax quad, is from the endothelial cells of a canine kidney that was harvested in 1958. So this was a lovely little cocker spaniel dog and they've harvested off those um, canine, uh, those kidney cells and they have just kept that cell line alive for all of these years. So what goes into a mammalian cell? Um, we have a better match coming out of a mammalian cell. And we certainly know through randomised controlled trials that the vaccine's really very, very well tolerated and elicits good antibody response to all of the vaccine strains. So looking at um, notifications, we can actually see that 2017 was a horrendous year and so was 2019. Um, but they looked very, very differently when we look at them on this particular graph. So if we were to look at um, 2017, which is this um, purple dotted line with the great big tall mountain, you can see that we tracked along quite nicely and then bang, it hit us and then it dropped away. If we looked at the little orange dotted line, we can see um, underneath that, that dark green line, which was 2020, that we had high interseasonal flu activity and then it slowly took off and it built and it built and it lasted and it lasted and eventually it went away. So there was very, very wide curve. So in other words, we had more notifications in 2019 than we did with that high tool peak in 2017. So interesting, like I said, um, that dark green line in for 2020 started off looking as though it could be a little bit of a problem year again for us, 
uh, with high interseasonal activity. But then look what happened. Come mid to the end of March, hmm, a little thing called COVID uh, and a little uh, intervention by the government to close borders. Uh, we really encouraged hand hygiene, social distancing, and who would have thought cough etiquette? We would have thought that these sorts of things we would have known for a long time. Um, some of us have known for a long time, others haven't. Um, so could have 2020 been a significant year for us had of COVID um, not come to our borders. So looking at what causes, what are the subtypes causing um, infection, it's a little bit hard at the moment to see anything happening in 2021 there because subtyping in Australia doesn't usually commence until about now, so early April, so there's really little data. But interestingly, globally, even though influenza activity still remains quite low, um, 85 countries have been reporting data to FluNet. Um, so looking at the period, the week of 15th of February to the 28th of February, um, the WHO, World Health Organization Laboratories tested um, 266,000 specimens, 387 were positive for influenza viruses, so fairly low rates. 48% of them were typed as influenza A, 51% were influenza B. Um, of those typed with influenza A, 34% were H1N1, and scarily, 65.6% were influenza A, H3, N2. So if flu comes to Australia this year, potentially at this stage, it looks like uh, H3N2 is the predominant circulating strain. So uh, we, we need to have our guard up and this is gonna be really interesting conversations when you actually have people um, interested in not having a flu vaccine this year because there's no cases. So like I said, really small, small, small activity. And you can see the flat red line that's representing um, flu activity for 2021. As at the 30th of March, ACT, you've had two cases, New South Wales, four cases, Northern Territory, seven, Queensland, 71. That's okay, you're prone to interseasonal flu activity. South Australia, we've just gone to nine cases, Tassie, six, Victoria 49 and Western Australia only nine cases. The media are reporting, I've heard, um, that it's going to be a bad flu season. Well, looking at the figures, we can't say that it is going to be a bad flu season. But we've got to remember that when COVID-19 vaccine uptake is high, and it will get to being quite a reasonable uptake, I'm sure. Restrictions will ease. Our borders will open, maybe to some countries, but not to all. It will let flu in the door. So maybe are the media reporting that it's gonna be a bad season because of H3 being a predominant circulating strain overseas? Not really sure what data they're actually um, calling in when they say that it's a bad flu season or going to be a bad flu season. So it's a bit of a watch, wait and see. Quadrivalent vaccines, as you can see here, that over 65s, all of the QIVs are licensed for use in over 65s. Fluad Quad is the funded vaccine and it is the preferred vaccine, but there is no evidence at all to bring them back in for a top up of Fluad Quad if they've only, or if they've received a standard influenza vaccine already this year. Looking at coverage, this is really a bit of an estimate, um, but we know that all flu vaccines haven't been getting reported to the AIR in past years, but certainly it can now. Just remember when you are reporting flu vaccines, um, please put one as the dose number, because you don't really know whether it's dose number 222 flu vaccines that someone might have had, I don't know. But it's the first one that they've had in 2021, 
So you would put it as dose one. If they're having a dose two, then of course record it as a dose two. But we've got a long way to go in coverage and it's about us recommending the vaccine. We know that if we recommend vaccine to people, they are nine times more likely to have the vaccine. So we are an important group of people um, to get high uptake of flu vaccine. Just remember COVID-19, this is the elephant in the room. Some of the symptoms are quite similar. Please go and get tested if you have any symptoms, get tested for COVID as well as for influenza. Um, so super, super important to check the AIR, the Australian Immunisation Register, to ensure that there's a 14 day interval um, between giving flu vaccine and COVID or COVID vaccine and any other vaccine. There's a great resource that you can pop up in your waiting room for your patients to look at because there's plenty of other respiratory pathogens causing infection or allergens causing allergy. So um, it's a great poster to have off the Department of Health website. Remember practice nurses, you are the most super, super, super people. You are absolutely great. You do a fantastic job out there. Um, you are the success of an immunization program. You spend more time with your patients than any other health professional. So it's a great opportunity to chat all things vaccination, reminding them not only of flu vaccines, but everything else they need. You know, pertussis boosters, Zostavax. Remember the catch up program finishes on the 31st of October this year. So if you've got people 71 to 79 that have not had their Zostavax vaccine, please get them in. This is an expensive vaccine, but talk to them also about their pneumococcal vaccines. Remember, you're not meant to know everything. No one knows everything. So use your tools, you use your handbook, the questions about vaccination um, booklet to answer your patient's questions. Um, remember vaccines are not emergency drugs. So if you don't know an answer to their question, it's best to just say, uh, look, I'm gonna get an answer to that question first. So perhaps we won't vaccinate today. Let's leave it for a day and I'll get back to you. So just a real quick wrap up because we've just gone over time. Um, certainly we understand that this is a serious disease or can be a very serious disease, but it can also be asymptomatic. People with underlying medical conditions, please recommend this vaccine to them, but recommend it to every single person over six months of age. We only have QIV vaccines. We do not have trivalent vaccines anymore. Remember to vaccinate those children under the age of five with your funded flu vaccine um, and just absolutely um, do that pre-vaccination checklist with every single person to identify those at-risk individuals. So Susie, I would just like to thank everybody for their time tonight, for spending an hour of their evening. Hopefully you've been drinking wine while I've been talking. Um, but certainly thank you for um, attending the webinar and I hope you found it really, really useful. Oh, thanks, Angela. You know, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone who's still attending an hour into the event to say you do such a fabulous job and we do appreciate it. And there's only one question to answer. So oh, we can finish up with Tendai's um, question. Just taking you back to that to the reaction of vaccines. If someone kept getting a metallic taste in their mouth after each vaccine, every time um, they get one, best advice? From uh, keep giving them vaccine and just that they're aware that it's going to happen. Yep. Um, it's, it's, it's nothing that really can be done about it, really. It's just the way their body responds to it. Um, so definitely, um, yeah, just keep Same recommending it. In terms of first aid for it, I think maybe just time and maybe sucking on a little bit of ice or something. Yeah, absolutely. And they, they will probably have tried several things. If it's happening every year um, that they have a flu vaccine, they've probably tried it. They know that a barley sugar might take the taste away or a mint or something like that. So. That's it.
Great. Well, thank you so much once again, again Angela. Um, for those still attending, there will be a survey at the end of the event tonight. So we really do appreciate your feedback. We do get some great feedback and also some ideas for what we can do in the future down the track um, and more events we can bring to you. So we're proud to do so. So thank you, Angela. And before we go, I just want to point out on the screen, you can see Vax Chat Australia. We have a podcast with six episodes. We're currently um, recording the third episode. So two episodes are currently available and we're talking about the COVID vaccine. And it's GP Rodney Pierce, who's the chair of the Immunisation Coalition, speaking to Susan Pierce about how to speak to your patients about the COVID vaccine. Um, it's up to date information, so I really recommend um, having listened into the short episodes. Uh, our Immunisation Coalition Art Prize is a really exciting uh, event that we're holding at the moment. Actually, the Art Prize closes, submissions close on the 1st of April, but we've got many fantastic submissions from primary age right through to um, people in their 60s and 70s who have helped us to communicate the message um, of the science of vaccination through their art. So we'll be promoting that during Influenza Action Week, the 26th to the 30th of April. Um, keep an eye on our website for all the events, including free vaccination cafes and um, education events, including podcasts and webinars. So on that note, thank you very much and happy Easter to everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.